Okay, so we're going to move on to solving quadratic equations, but by using factoring. So now we have different methods to solve quadratic equations. Uh, up until now, we have graphed them. We have looked at them in two different forms, standard form, vertex form. We have identified the vertex, the axis of symmetry, whether we're opening up or down, and we talked about the roots. So recall that the zeros or roots are, remember, solutions or x values of the x-intercept are in fact the values that solve this function. They set the output to zero. And these are real numbers. So if I were to try to figure out what those X values were, what are the values if I were to substitute into the function would give me output of zero? Would help me identify the X intercepts if they exist? Well, we can approach it many different ways. We can look at that quadratic expression on, yes, what? It switched, we're good now? No, we're not good. I see it in the meeting. You don't see it in the meeting? I see it on people's screens. So maybe you have to close out and get back on because I see it. So close out and get back on the call if you have to. OK, so if I were to look at these quadratic equations, and right now we're dealing with quadratic functions, they, the graphs open up or down. If I were to look at the right hand side, y equal, the right hand side is just a quadratic trinomial or quadratic equation. So let's talk about the different ways that we were able to factor. We can either factor the greatest common factor out of all the terms, something that we can divide each of the terms by, or we could factor the trinomials uh, one way using if the leading coefficient is one, but then we're going to use the same method if the leading coefficient is not one, if that A is not one, and then there are some special factoring that we need to be able to recognize, such as the difference of two squares or a perfect square trinomial. So let's just review these. These should be familiar to you from Algebra 1, but just in case they're not, let's go through these methods. So the first step is to always look for a greatest common factor. If I'm looking for a greatest common factor, I'm looking, let's look at example one, what is the most I can divide out of each of these two terms? Okay, so you're saying a nine. And then what about with respect to the X? What is the, what's the largest power? Oops, what's the largest power of X I can factor out? X squared, it's always the smallest, right? Because you can't take more out than what you have. So if I were to factor out a nine X squared being my greatest common factor, Let's see what's going to be left over after I divide each of those terms by that greatest common factor. If I divide each of those terms by the greatest common factor, what am I going to have left over inside the parentheses or braces? It doesn't matter how you denote it. 2x plus 3. Very good. And if I wanted to check it, I could just redistribute multiplication, right? This is your distributive property. Uh, over addition, and then I should get back the original expression. That's how you take out a greatest common factor. Now, what happens in this case if I have terms, but look, they're a little bit more complicated, but what do you notice each of these has that I could factor out? Well, I don't, I, I see a binomial. Right? Don't they both share the binomial x plus 3? OK, so if I factor out x plus 3, let's see what's left over inside. If I divide the first term by x plus 3, what's left? x squared. And what about in my second? 5, yes. And again, I could redistribute to see if I get the original expression. 
Okay, what about the next one? I'm looking at each of these and I'm asking myself, what is the most I can factor out of each of those? And you would say 2x squared. And let's see what we have left over. What's left over inside? 5x minus 2. Good. And again, I could check it by redistributing and seeing if I get my original expression. Now, what about the next one? Okay, they both have an x minus 7. And what's left over inside? 2x plus 3. And again, that these are that in this case, I just have a binomial times a binomial. I foil it and I should get back my original expression and maybe a different way of looking at it. Okay. Now, what happens if I have a quadratic trinomial expression and I want to factor that? And in this instance, I want to focus on the fact that I have a leading coefficient of, oops, of one, okay? So I'm looking at a quadratic trinomial expression. And again, we're just going over our factoring so that when we embed these expressions into an equation, we know how to address and, and find the roots. So here's a quadratic trinomial. Hopefully you notice that the leading coefficient, your a is one. And if I want to factor that, I am going to try to figure out how to represent this quadratic trinomial as a product of two binomials. So the first thing I want to do is I want to look at factors of eight. So I'm going to look at factors, find two factors of C. In this case, which is eight, whose sum is B. OK, so let's think of our factors of C. Well, C is eight. What are some factors of eight? Four and two. If you didn't think of that one first, you could have said one and eight. But remember, they have to sum to B. Four plus two is six. Well, B is six, so I found it, right? In this case, I would have nine. Oops, sorry, that one plus eight is nine. And that would not be the value of B. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna find your factors of C that sum to give you b. Those values are going to go here. So the first terms, if we remember how to FOIL, the first terms have to multiply to give you this. Then the outer and the inner have to add to give you b. And then they have to multiply to give you c. So that would be your answer in factored form. If I were to FOIL that, I would get back my original quadratic trinomial. Okay, let's try the next one. In the next one, I want to maybe identify C and B. So I'm looking for factors of C that add to give me B. Can we think of two, two numbers that multiply to give me 40, but add to give me 13? Five and eight. So I'm going to factor this quadratic trinomial. The first terms multiply give me x squared. These terms add to give me b, but multiply to give me c. Do we remember how to factor? This is coming back to you. OK, let's try another one. C is negative 18, B is 3. I'm looking for numbers that multiply to give me negative 18, but add to give me 3. What do you have for me? I'm sorry, 6 and negative 3. That is correct. So when I factor, 
first terms are x. Now, does it matter whether I wrote this binomial first and this binomial second? Could I have written x minus 3 times x plus 6? Yeah, either one works. What property tells you that it works? Do we remember? Commutative property of multiplication. Okay. All right, let's look at the next one. C is negative 14, B is negative 5. So I'm looking for factors of negative 14 that add to give me negative 5. Negative 7 and positive 2. Yep. Very good. Okay, so here are little tricks for you to look at what happens when these signs are positive versus when one is negative and one is positive versus whether the other first term is positive and or addition and subtraction. So that, you know, these are little hints here. Okay, now let's go through this process, but now it's a little bit more complicated when the leading coefficient is not one. So when the leading coefficient is not one, we are going to use a method that is called splitting the middle. You may or may not remember this. So if I'm being asked to factor this quadratic trinomial, and I notice that A is not 1, the first step is to multiply A times C. Multiply A times C. The second step is to look for factors of that product. So look for factors of AC that sum to B. Same process. The third step is to split the middle term. And we again write these terms in exponentially descending order. We split the middle term using the factors as coefficients. And last but not least, we factor by grouping. Okay, so we have the steps. Let's actually work some examples using these steps. So the first step was to multiply A times C. So A times C, 8 times negative 3 is negative 24. I'm now going to look for factors of negative 24 that add to give me negative 10. What two factors of negative 24 would add to give me negative 10, negative 12 and two, beautiful, right? So I'm gonna bring the first term down, I'm not changing it. I'm gonna bring the last term down, I'm not changing it, but I'm splitting this little negative 10x into two terms. I'm gonna split it into plus two x and minus 12 x. Now, again, does it matter whether I had put the negative 12x first and the 2x second? No, it doesn't matter. If you don't believe me, try it. Okay, so I've split this middle term into these two. Plus 2x minus 12x gives me that negative 10x. Does everybody see how I've gotten that and split it? Okay, now what does it say? factor by grouping. So I'm going to factor these two terms together and those two terms together. What is the greatest common factor for the first two terms? 2x. And what's left over inside? Well, that's the first one. What about the second one? No, 2x divided by 2x is what? 1. And that's kind of ugly. I mean, you have to have something there. You're doing division. 
And then I look at the second two terms and I'm asking myself, what can I factor out the greatest common factor? And we kind of want to get this as the inside, what's left over. So what am I going to factor out of those two terms? Negative three, which would give me four X plus one. Now make sure you're writing this term. Negative three divided by negative three goes there. You can't just ignore it. Why? Because if we were to redistribute at the end of our problem, we need to get back that original problem. Now I'm not done because I noticed that that one has a 4x plus 1 and this one has a 4x plus 1. So I can factor out 4x plus 1 and what's left over. There you go, and that is your final answer. If I were to FOIL that, I'd get back the original quadratic trinomial. OK, let's try another one. First step, multiply A times C. A times C is what? Negative 42, excellent. I'm looking for factors of negative 42 that give me 19. Yes, 21 and negative 2. So I bring down the first term on the last term with the sign, don't forget, and now I'm splitting that. And again, it doesn't matter which one you write first. And then I factor by grouping. Greatest common factor for the first two terms. 2x, giving me inside, what's left? 3x minus 1, and then let's go ahead and take the greatest common factor out here, so hopefully we get this on the inside. What are you factoring out? Plus 7. You with me? Okay, now they each have a 3x minus 1, leaving me 2x plus 7. That's my final answer. I'm going to leave the next three till we go through all the factoring skills so you can practice a few of those. But let's move on to factoring expressions that are special factors, special factors. So we have the difference of two squares. The difference of two squares. You should be able to recognize the difference of two squares. A squared minus B squared. Difference, subtraction, two squared terms. The difference of two squares terms is the product of the conjugates. Okay, so A plus B times A minus B is going to give you A squared minus B squared. So this is going to be A squared this is going to be b squared. So then the factored form is just a plus b, a minus b. So in this problem, it's x plus 2 times x minus 2. You see how we took the square root of this to get this? And we took the square root of this to get this. Difference of two squares. If you recognize it, your life is a little bit easier. Okay. What happens if I have coefficients in front of the x squared? I'm still going to identify a squared and b squared, but when I write it, if I take the square root of 36 X squared, what is that going to give me? 6 X. And if I take the square root of 25, that becomes plus 5 minus 5. OK, I'm leaving these two as an exercise for us to come back to. The next beautiful little factoring, special factoring, deals with 
perfect square trinomials. Perfect square trinomials. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Perfect square trinomials are a result of taking a binomial and squaring it, whether it's a sum or a difference. So if it's a sum, that means I'm taking this little base, a plus b, and squaring it. If it's a difference, I'm squaring that binomial. How is that represented in terms of the trinomial? If this is plus, then this is plus. If this is minus, these are both minus. The second term b squared is all, I mean the third term b squared is always plus. We have to be able to recognize these though. So in this case, I can look at the first example and I can say, oh, okay, well, A is X, because I took the square root of X squared, and B is the square root of nine, which is three. I also recognize that this is a plus, so I know I'm going to use this one. So how would I write that in terms of the product of two binomials? Yes, which is just X plus three squared. Now you have to really understand that if you have a binomial squared, it is the binomial times itself. Don't you even think of say it distributing that two to each of them inside. That's a sum, not a product. OK, now in the next one, I see perfect square, perfect square. I'm thinking this might be a perfect square trinomial and, and I can check it if I wanted to. And I see that this is subtraction. So let's see if it works. Oops, A would be what? Five. Mm-hmm, five, five what? Five X, right? Because I'm square, square rooting this whole thing. B is six. So I'm going to have what squared? Beautiful. Which is the same thing as this. And I could foil to check. I'm going to leave the next two as practice once we finish going over all the different factoring methods. OK, so now let's embed these into equations and see how we are going to find these two X values. Maybe unique, maybe not. We'll see. And and how those represents the roots to your quadratic function. Now again, recall when we looked at the graph of a parabola, uh, whether it opened up or down, we had those three different instances, right? We had the parabola where the vertex was touching the x-axis, saying that we had one unique root, multiplicity two. We had the parabola, so that was this. Oops. We also had the instance where the parabola crossed the x-axis twice, so those would be two real roots. And then we had the parabola not crossing the x-axis at all, which means we had no real roots. So I want you to always think, I'm looking for the x values that make the y values zero. So I can set this beautiful little quadratic equation to y equals zero, and I could just factor the right-hand side if it's factorable, and I could get you those two x values. Once I factor this quadratic trinomial, I have two little binomials most of the time, and I can set each of those equal to zero because that's the zero product property. Think of these as your two factors set equal to zero. I can set each of them equal to zero. So let's walk through an example. Here you have a quadratic function. Quadratic, the highest degree of X is two, function. It's written in function notation. 
So I'm going to set my function equal to zero. I'm going to set f of x. I'm going to set y equal to zero. Then I'm going to factor the left hand side. What are the two factors of that quadratic trinomial on the left hand side? I, beautiful. And again, you could always FOIL to check. Now the zero product property says that I can set each of these little factors equal to zero. So X is gonna equal four or X could equal two. So that is saying when X is two and X is four, then I have found the roots, the X values of the X intercepts. So your X corresponding X intercepts where this graph of this parabola cross the X axis are at four zero and two zero. Let's try another one. You're asked to find the zeros of this quadratic function by factoring. So first step, set it equal to zero. Now let's factor the left hand side. Now, is there a greatest common factor? Because that's the first thing you want to check. No, there isn't. So I'm going to factor by splitting the middle. I'm going to split the middle. And remember to split the middle, I noticed that my leading coefficient is not one, so I have to multiply a times c, two times negative 12, which gives me negative 24. And I'm looking for factors of negative 24 that add to give me what? Negative five. And so what are the two factors going to be? Beautiful, negative eight and three. So I bring the first term down. I bring the last term down. I split that middle term to, and again, it doesn't matter which you put first and which you put second. Then I'm gonna factor by grouping. So greatest common factor for the first two terms is what? Mm, three isn't divisible by two even right okay so x and then that's going to leave me one on the inside two x squared divided by x is what two x and then three x divided by x is three okay what is my greatest common factor here hoping to get this on the inside once I factor it out. Negative four, and then negative eight X divided by negative four is, and then negative 12 divided by negative four is plus three. And again, we were trying to get this, right? Now remember, these are all set equal to zero. Then I can factor out a two X plus three, leaving me X minus four. I can set each of those equal to zero. and I solve for X in each of them. That's gonna give me two X equals negative three and X equal four. I'm still not done. I have to divide by two in the first equation. So I get X equal negative three halves and X equal four. So my solution set is these two values of X. The corresponding X intercepts would be points, right? So this is the solution set. And these are corresponding X intercepts. So far so good. Now I'm going to leave the next one as an exercise for you to come back to. But I would like to look at number four because something very interesting happens in number four. So if I'm looking at number four, I see it's a quadratic equation, but I don't see 
it written in a form where I can set it equal to zero. So what might be the first thing you'd want to do? Yes. OK, that's going to give me X squared minus 4X plus 4 equals zero. Now, can I factor? Ah. The left hand side. Maybe you see it, maybe you don't. Is it a perfect square trinomial? Mm hmm. Now, the zero product property says I set each of these equal to zero. They both give me the same value of X. So we would call this a repeated root. It has multiplicity too, if you if you are truly interested. And what that's going to say is when I graph it, when x is equal to two, you know, it's going to it's going to touch there for the x-axis. Now, what if I give you the zeros? What if I tell you what the x values are? What if I say the zeros are four and negative seven? Well, you're going to reverse engineer this problem. You're going to say, all right, I have a root. I have another root. I have two solutions. So can I not turn those into little binomials and work backwards? Can't I move the four over? You see how I rewrote that? Setting them equal to zero. And then I know the zero product property says that I can put those together into one equation. And then what could I do if I wanted to get this quadratic equation in standard form? Foil, yes. So first, outer, inner, last, combine like terms. So if I asked you to write the equation of the quadratic function in standard form, which is what it says right here, that has those zeros, I have my function. And that's what you would be expected to do. I move this to the other side. Yeah, so if I if I add seven to the both sides, right? If I add seven here and add seven here, the left hand side is going to be X plus seven. The right hand side is going to be zero. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to get two equations each equal to zero so that I could combine them. So that I could foil it so that I could get the quadratic function. OK, let's do an application problem and then we're going to go back to all the ones we skipped. I'm going to let you work them and then we're going to go over the answers. But I want to do an application problem first. OK, so let's take a look at the function that you've been given. Now this is a this is the, the a, a standard. Function due to gravity. OK, this is a quadratic function, the highest degree of the variable T is two. H is a function of T. So the height. Is why it's called H. Is a function of T, which is time. OK, now this negative 16 is a gravitational constant. It's a given. It's been determined by someone much smarter than all of us. OK, this little V naught V with a subscript of zero. Means when time equals zero, my initial vertical velocity. Is that value so V naught means V at time zero V with a little subscript zero. It's very popular in physics V naught. OK, so that's your initial velocity. H naught. Guess what is your initial height? Your height at time equals zero. OK, so this is a very well known equation. And I'm giving it to you. So let's read the word problem. The word problem states. 
Ford hits a golf ball from ground level with initial velocity of 80 feet per second. After how many seconds, so we're solving for T, will the ball hit the ground again before rolling in for a hole in one? So if you have Ford standing here with a little golf club, right? About to hit the ball. Then he hits the ball, it goes up and it comes back down, right? That's a parabola, opens down. Oh, makes sense because look at that gravitational constant's negative, A is negative. Okay, so we're hitting the ball. The initial velocity, so what have I given you? What does that mean in the, equa in the equation? What is that? That's V naught, right? V naught is 80 feet per second. So guess what I have to do? I just write the equation of this little projectile motion, substituting in the initial velocity. So let's write the equation. I have h of t, which I'm solving for, is negative 16 t squared plus, I know my initial velocity is what? 80 t plus h naught. Now, where's the initial height? Where, what is the initial height of the ball? It's zero, right? The initial height is zero. So we're substituting in 80 for the initial velocity and zero for the initial height. The ball is at the, on the ground. Now, if it's asking after how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? Again, I'm looking for the other point, right? I'm, I'm looking for this. OK, the height at that point is also zero. So let's go ahead and solve the quadratic equation by factoring. OK, so I take this equation. I don't need to see the zero and I set it equal to zero. What might be the first thing you want to do when you're trying to solve this by factoring? What do we want to hopefully find? Greatest common factor. Is there one? Is there a bigger one? Negative 16 T. Now you could have chosen eight, but you'd have to factor again. So let's choose the biggest of all possible, the greatest common factor. So if I factor out negative 16 T from each of these, what do I have left over inside the parentheses? T, what? No, minus five. Now, I have two factors set equal to zero. Guess what? I can set each of them equal to zero and solve for t. So if I divide by negative 60, zero divided by a number is zero as long as the number you're not dividing by is zero, in which case that's a bigger discussion. OK, so I know when t equals zero, I'm, I'm, I'm on the ground. I haven't hit the ball yet. I hit the ball, it goes up, it comes back down. How long does it take for it to hit the ground again? Okay, so this is my starting time. My initial time. And then that's the time it hits the ball, the, the ground again. So after five seconds, right, the ball hits the ground. I've answered the question. Now, I could even go so far as to say, hey, at what height is the ball the highest? And how far away is that? What would I be looking for? What would I be solving for? What point on that parabola? If I'm asking for the highest the ball ever gets, I'm looking for the maximum. And what point on the parabola would identify that? The vertex! Right? So I could find the vertex. The input value would be the time, how long it takes to get there. The output would be the height at which it reaches the maximum height. Right? So, I mean, there's all sorts of questions that you could be asked on this. So what I'd like you to do next is I'd like you to go back and let's talk about the problems that you should be working 
Ugh. Okay, you should be working right now. This one. This one. Everything we skipped, you are doing right now. And then we'll check our answers. So everything you skipped, go back and do those problems to see if you really understood what we discussed. Those are the only ones. You do them, I do them, we compare answers. Ava, if you want to finish your bell ringer now and then submit it, that's fine as well. Yes. You getting them? Yay. Mm-hmm, absolutely.
Are they making sense? Are we getting them? Kind of? Feel free to check your answers. Thank you.